I'm Pastor David Becker, Pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, thanks also to KKIN Radio for broadcasting this service. It is available online at stjohnaitkin.org. At St. John Aiken .org. The present time on Sunday mornings, we are holding in person services at 9 a.m. And this is the second Sunday in Lent. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We now confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro, it comes from Psalm 115. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and the great. He will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, and I'll begin at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations and from an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be your name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For my children's lesson for today, I want to talk about our names. Uh, my first name, my, my given name, my Christian name, as some people call it, is David. And that name means beloved. I don't know what your name is, I don't know what your name means, but it probably has some meaning, and you may know that meaning. In the last lesson that I just read from the book of Genesis, we hear about Abram and his wife Sarai, and they are given new names. Um, Abram is going to be now Abraham, because Abraham means father of many nations, and uh, Sarai is given a new name, which is Sarah, which means princess, princess. I called my first name, my given name, my Christian name also. Why do we call it that? Well, because in the old days, you would name a child at the time of their baptism. That was when the name was given. So, as we think about our baptism, we can think about the fact that we not only have our given name, our Christian name, our first name, but we have another name which we can go by, and that is the name Christian. Christian. That's who we are. When we have faith in Jesus Christ, we are a Christian. And as a Christian, we belong to God. As a Christian, we have the forgiveness of sins. As a Christian, as one who believes in Jesus Christ, we have the promise that one day we will go to heaven. What a special name that name Christian is, and what special gifts we have from God. Amen. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, and I'll begin at the first verse. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 8, and I'll begin to 27th verse. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. 
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once again, I'm Pastor David Becker of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thank you for tuning in today. Our text for our consideration comes from uh, the, our gospel lesson. It is our gospel lesson. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38 of which I just want to reread the following. And Jesus called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here ends the reading of our text. When we have a purpose in life, we do things on purpose. When we have a goal we want to achieve, we do things to reach that goal. So what are some goals that people might have? Well, for some, the goal is to make lots of money. Money they can use to do what they want to do, to buy what they want, to go where they want. They want to have enough money to have a nice house, to buy a fancy car, and to have a comfortable retirement. So they get a job, they work, and they do other things intentionally in order to reach their goal. For some people, their goal is what they want to be able, is that they want to be able to be in control of their lives. They want to be in charge of who they are and what they get to do and what they can say. And maybe they want to be in charge of other people, to be able to say something and have other people do things for them. So they do things to make that happen. Other people, they want to be popular. They want to be liked. They want to be part of a group. They want to be included. They want a certain amount of prestige. They want to be looked up to. So they do things intentionally, on purpose, to reach that goal. So what is the purpose in your life? Before you answer that question, I think we should look at what happened to Jesus in our text. There he is on the road to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? He gets a variety of answers. Some of the disciples said he's John the Baptist, um, who has come back from the dead. Some say he's Elijah, also who would be come back from the dead. 
and others are saying he's one of the prophets. Again, someone, one of those that would come back from the dead. And then Jesus changes the question. Not who do people say that I am, but now he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, one of the disciples, speaks up and says, you are the Christ. It's a great answer. It's a wonderful answer. It's the right answer. The problem is, as we see in our text, Peter has the wrong idea about what the Christ would do. The Christ was the one whom God had promised to send throughout the Old Testament. Well, Peter thinks that this Christ is going to be someone with power, someone who will make his dreams come true. Peter is hoping that the Christ will overthrow the Roman government so that they could be free, so there's no more oppression. Peter believes that the Christ will show incredible political and military power. As for money and possessions, Peter thinks that this Christ will give them a country where everyone will be safe and they can do whatever they want to do and they'll be able to, to say whatever they want to do. They want this, they, he thought that this nation, this Christ would bring about a place a wonderful place to live where there will be no worries. What's more, the disciples of Christ, Peter thinks, should get prime spots, have prestige with people looking up to them. But that's not the kind of Christ Jesus had come to be. Jesus had to correct this false understanding of what the Christ will do. So, Jesus says, the Son of Man must. The Greek word for must is just three letters long. The three letters would be the Greek equivalents to our English letters of D, E, and I. Day. It means it is necessary. Those three letters, that Greek word, it is necessary. In other words, this has to happen. It must occur. What has to happen is that the Son of Man must suffer many things. The Son of Man must be rejected, Jesus says. The Son of Man must be killed. That is Jesus' purpose in life. Why was all of this necessary? Well, one reason is the Old Testament says it's going to happen. We can go back, for example, to Isaiah chapter 53. There the Christ is described as one who will be despised and rejected. He will be stricken, smitten, and afflicted. He will bear our griefs. He will carry our sorrows. By his stripes we will be healed. Upon him the Lord will lay all our iniquity. The Old Testament says that. So it must happen to Jesus, for he is the Christ. Another reason why this must happen is because God has given Jesus this mission. Jesus has to live up to his name. You know what the name Jesus means? It means... The one who saves. God has given this purpose, this mission, this name, this task to Jesus. He is to save his people, to forgive them, to reconcile them to God. As we heard in our epistle lesson for today, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The result is we are reconciled to God. That's why Jesus must suffer, be rejected, and killed. That is his purpose in life. He has to reconcile us to God, to forgive us, and to give us salvation. Now that we've heard Jesus' purpose in life, and what he did on purpose, let's go back to that question for you and me. What is our purpose in life? 
Of course, we can have a number of purposes in life. We don't have to boil it down just to one. But we do have a clear purpose given at the end of our Bible passage. Um, we are to take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow Jesus. What might that purpose of denying ourselves, taking up our crosses and following Jesus look like? Well, here's a couple examples. Uh, the first one has to do with some advertisements that were on TV a few years back. They were public service announcements. Uh, the Ad Council put them out. In one, a man climbed up some stairs on crutches. A voice is, then tells the viewer that the man could have learned to walk if only someone had given the money to build a rehab center. A similar commercial shows a woman alone in the room. A voice told the viewer that this woman almost received a meal and a visit from someone, but she didn't because no one volunteered to bring that meal. The point of these ads was to help people realize the good they can do if they are willing to give up their time and money. So what do we do when we deny ourselves and follow Jesus? We give. We give of that money we think we've worked so hard to get. We give of the time that we have, even though we might get a little fame for doing so. But we do this on purpose. I read about some research that was done a few years back by studying obituaries. Over the course of a number of months, the researchers read through a couple thousand obituaries. And what were they looking for in these obituaries? They wanted to know what words were used most often to describe people's lives. Guess what the number one word was? The word was help. The word that was used most often was that word help. People weren't remembered for their position or their popularity or their power or how much money they had. They were remembered because they helped others. They helped veterans or the disabled or some organization. To follow Jesus is to be remembered as someone who intentionally helped, who took up the task of loving a neighbor as Jesus has loved us. See how this works? You do something on purpose because you have a purpose in life. As Christians, our purpose in life is to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses and follow Jesus. Why? It's because Jesus had a purpose. On purpose, he suffered. It was necessary for him to die. He had to be killed and then rise again. And he did all this on purpose for you and for me. It was all to give us life and to give us a clear purpose for the lives we live each day. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. O Lord, in these Lenten days, set our minds on your things rather than the things of man, that we may deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow your Son through this life into the joys of his resurrection. O Lord, you've given your church the joy of proclaiming the truth that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we might be justified by his blood and saved from your wrath over our sins. Grant all pastors the gifts of your spirit to preach and teach this truth boldly and faithfully, and help us to confess it in word and deed in our daily lives. Be with our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico. Bless them as they share your word. Be with Lutheran Island Camp as they try to make plans for this coming summer season. O oh Lord, keep us from being ashamed of the Son of Man when we face persecution for his name in this world. That we may not be ashamed, that he may not be ashamed of us when he comes in your glory with the angels. 
be near to all of those who are facing martyrdom for Christ and sustain them unto the end, that they may be crowned with life before you. O Lord, since all kingship belongs to you and you rule over the nations, we pray that you bless those who govern us in your stead, that we may be ruled wisely and in accord with your will. O Lord, through your Holy Spirit, pour your love into the hearts of all those who suffer in our midst, that their suffering may produce endurance, endurance character, and character a hope that will not put them to shame. Grant them health and healing in accord with your perfect will and sustain them in all their trials. O Lord, as we remember with thanksgiving the multitude of nations that rejoice in heaven before you with your father, with their father Abraham, we pray that you would sustain us in the same justifying faith that as his offspring we may share in the everlasting covenant you made with him. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. And we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Once again, I'm Pastor David Becker of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thanks for tuning in today. I, I pray that you'll have a blessed week.